Good morning, everyone. Today is 12 June, the year 2006. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Library of Congress, the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the uh, museum and have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Jacqueline Sutton. Her father, Lieutenant Commander Jack Sutton, was a, plane ca was a, um, a ship's engineer in the U.S. Navy for 30 years, from 1919 till 1949. And her husband was PFC Richard Work, and he was a plane captain on aircraft carriers in the Pacific during World War II. So we're going to talk to her about that and a lot of other things. Jacqueline, nice to have you here, Thank dear. Thank you very much. Now, uh, first of all, would you please repeat and spell might as well, your, your full name, please? My name is Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E. -E. My maiden name was Sutton, and Jack Markley Sutton was my father. Okay. and. Um, Okay, let's, uh, and then, uh, okay, uh, let's talk about your father then, uh, his name, spell his name for us, please. Jack Markley, M-A-R-K-L-E-Y, S-U-T-T-O-N. And when and where was he born? He was born in Iron City, Tennessee, in 1899. Okay, um, and um, we might as well start talking about him first. Now, where is uh, Iron City? Tennessee, it's about... Oh, I would say 50 miles from the Tri-Cities, uh, where the uh, uh, Tennessee River is uh, uh, dammed up. Wilson Dam is there, and you—it's a little, a little to the—it's a little to the north, a little to the west of uh, Huntsville. If you uh, go to Huntsville, no. but the, the Space Center there, Alabama, and yeah, so uh, Alabama. So it's so just across the line. Okay. So the dam, Tennessee. you say, was that part of the TVA project? That was, that was the beginning of the TVA project. Oh. She's, a, she's a real old dam, and she <laughs> looks it too, but works like a champ. Yeah. She's still working good, and there's uh, the Pickwick, there's a whole bunch of them on the Tennessee. And uh, what was his father's name? Uh, uh, Marvin Markley Sutton. And what did he do? He was, he was a judge. Uh, Justice of the Peace, uh -huh. and uh, and various other things. Had he, did he go to law school or? No, no. He didn't have. To no, he was elected. Uh huh. Uh, back in, uh, in uh, Dad grew up in Sheffield, Alabama, which is the uh, Tri Cities, which is Florence, Tuscumbia, where Helen Keller came from, oh. and Sheffield. And Dad, my dad. Jack grew up in Sheffield. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, your uh, 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 grandmother, uh, do you remember her name? Maudie, M A U D E, Esther Phillips, P H I L L I P S. Okay. And she was from Springfield, Missouri. Oh, Missouri, okay. So how did they meet each other? They met as pen pals. Really? Mm -hmm. He was in the Yangtze fleet on the Yangtze River. Okay, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we talking about your dad or your grandfather? <coughs> well, my, my dad. Okay, no, I'm, I'm talking, right now I'm talking about <coughs> your grandfather, your grandfather who was the oh, judge. Oh, Marvin? Yes. Oh. His, his wife. Uh, his, she was Sally B. Umphreys was her married name, but she was a steward. S T U A R T, and General Jeb Stewart. I was just going to ask if she was, was related to him. Was related, uh -oh. and uh, there's all kinds of family stories about. And my dad always maintained and and swore that he knew and saw Jim, and they called him Uncle Jim. His name was James Ewell Brown. Stewart, and, but and they were from he, the Virginia Stewarts, 
But he was supposedly killed during He the was supposed to be killed, at, or the, the thing is mortally wounded, they call it in the encyclopedia. Right. Mortally wounded at the battle of, uh, a seven day battle before Richmond, at the Battle of Yellow Tavern. Right. And he was killed, or mortally wounded there. And then, uh, uh, of course, after the war, everybody that had, I just got through uh, viewing gods and generals, and he appears in the, in the first, right. with uh, the General Lee. Mm -hmm. The story goes that when General Lee heard about his so-called demise, because they reported him dead, but it says mortally wounded, well, Nevertheless, uh, when General Lee heard that General Stewart Jeb was dead, he cried and cried. He loved him like a brother. Yeah, yeah. He was a he was a gallant, dashing. dashing. He and wore daring. he wore a hat with a big. Uh, plume in it, and uh, a couple of times he let General Lee down. General Lee wanted him to go uh, circle around and do and cut some uh, division off. And, 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 yeah. and he was out, he rode up there and scared Washington. They'd ride up and down the bank and holler and shoot their guns. War, that was a big deal, scaring Washington. And of course, a lot of people don't know that, but that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, that's that's my background. Oh my goodness. my uh, mother's side of the family, from back east of Ohio, they came out in a covered wagon to the Ozark Mountains, and my grandmother was married to a a wagon team owner, and they lived in the Indian Nation, and he she was uh, he was killed, and she had three little girls out there. And uh, I believe it was in Oklahoma, Southern Oklahoma. And uh, they lived out there. She had three little bitty girls. And so she went to live with her uh, her brother James in Miami, Oklahoma. It's spelled Miami, but in Oklahoma it's called Miami, Oklahoma. And then she met my grandfather, who was Samuel Hickman Phillips. And he fought in the Civil War. And I don't know, I know he was a courier, but he, as usual, he was very close-mouthed about a lot was of things. Was he Union or? Oh, he was Union, Union, yeah. We think he was Union. He, it was, if this, it depended on if he was, how he felt that day. Sometimes he was a rebel and sometimes he was a Yankee. <laughs> but <clears throat> we know, I never do. And uh, he was, uh, he escaped, he was uh, caught. Uh, once and the story goes they're of course on horseback and I believe it was probably it was I don't know I think don't think it was in the wilderness but it was uh, in, in some battle and the story goes he was captured and they were taking him to prison and he was determined not to go to the prisons because uh, if you did you'd better off dying on the battlefield rather than dying in those prisons North and South didn't matter. They were both terrible. Up around Chicago was a horrible well, I prison. I just about that. Okay. And uh, so anyway, uh, Samuel, my dad, my grandfather, Hickman Phillips, they was riding along. He had he had uh, men on each side of him and one behind, which is why they escorted. And he was he charmed them. And he talked to them, and he got their mind off of whatever they were thinking. And then they came to a certain place, and he vaulted off of his horse and rolled down the embankment, and rolled under, he rolled a road down this embankment, under, and he got under an old dead log, and he hit out. And they, of course, immediately jumped out and ran around trying to find him, searching, searching. Their boots was within six inches of his face. And he kept, he held his breath, I would imagine. And he 
manage to get back to his own lines. Now, um, okay, your ancestors, uh, did they come from Europe or how did they? Mine were the Scottish. You were Scottish. Yeah, I was Scottish. Scottish yeah. And uh, uh, my, uh, my grandmother was Pennsylvania Dutch. She was from uh, Ohio, Vinton County, Ohio. So I think and, and she and her uh, family moved, came evidently in, as far as I can remember, it was uh, the stories probably in the 1870s, uh, to start for, for the West, as a lot of people did. Had a good farm and everything. I don't know why they started out like that. All those little children, they got as far as the Ozark Mountains. And my grandmother died of probably pneumonia. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any food. They, they were freezing to death. They were camped out in the Ozark Mountains. The Ozark Mountains are beautiful to look at, but they're rocky, total rock. There's no farmland. There's nothing but you have to farm in a, what they call the bottomland. And uh, they, my grandmother's name was Amanda Hulda uh, Tur uh, uh, Turner, and uh, she, there was all these little children, there's probably six little children, they were starving to death, they were dying. My grandmother had died, great-grandmother had died, who I have a picture of, I have mm -hmm. the miniatures of him and my great grandmother and my great grandfather. And the miniature has, in those days, the man posed with the guns. He was, a, of course, a Yankee uniform. He had his gun like this, and they put her picture on the left. So my great grandmother decided, I don't want you pointing that gun at me. So she took ink and inked out the gun. So therefore, there's this ink splotch right in the middle of the picture, but it's him, nevertheless. But at that time, I can't prove any of this. There's no record. But it was very, very true because the people, my, my people knew it. Three men came riding up, young men. And they said, what's happening here? And my grandfather, my great grandfather, told them what had happened. They could look around and see here was a whole family starving to death, no, nothing. They said, the one young man says, just take it easy, we'll be back. They rode off at high speed. Oh, probably a half a day later, came back. Had a calf, skinned and ready to go. His name was Jesse James. Oh, yeah. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why, if you go to the Ozark Mountains and you talk about Jesse and Frank James, the, the people, the old people, the people that settled there said, don't talk about Jesse. Jesse was a good man. Yeah, heard that before. And so, uh, they will not talk about Jesse or Frank. Yeah. Frank, of course, lived a long time after that. Yeah. But Jesse, uh, of course, got shot by that little, dirty little coward who shot Mr. Howard. Bob Ford. <coughs> yeah, Ford. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's, that, that's, that's... you got a really interesting background there. Now, your dad, um, so where did he grow up then? He yeah. grew up in Sheffield, Alabama. And that's a little town? Or a little what? town, Tuscumbia, right there, Tri-Cities, right there, going to the Tennessee River. Uh -huh. And I guess he went to school? He went to the... Catholic school, was across the street. Oh, okay. And he went there, and he went to school, Catholic school. Do you remember the name of the school? No, it's, it's, oh. it, it was one of those old, tiny churches, yeah, you know, all right. wood and everything. Sure. <clears throat> and uh, so they... They, uh, he grew up there. And, were there uh, were there many Catholics in that area yes, at that time? Yes, a lot. Because okay. down lot south, Catholics. some places there aren't too many. Yeah, yeah. and the, the sisters loved my dad. He was very smart. And in those days, school, elementary school, they had algebra 
and mm -hmm. high mathematics. They didn't fool around like they do today. My. Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, he had a beautiful tenor voice, uh -oh. and they had him sing. And every time they could get a chance, they had an uh, entertainment. And my dad was the always had my dad sing because he had a beautiful tenor voice. And when, in 1935, when we left San Diego and went through the canal, headed towards Guantanamo Bay on the old USS Shawmont, I found out, of course, he had, from Sheffield, was one of the uh, boys he, he knew, the family. Uh, you see, this is my age creeping up. He was the superintendent of the Peter McGill Lock. That was quite a job. I mean, that was a very yeah, important job. Mm -hmm. And so he knew Dad. And the woodcock, the old the woodcock, she was a little minesweeper, and he was the chief engineer. And he, uh, she was painted the great white fleet colors. She was uh, had the white hull and the tan superstructure. And she was a, she was my brother's ship and my ship. We were the only kids, and the sailors adopted us, and we were their kids. We had a free run. But it, I found out with Dad, with his beautiful tenor voice, every what our Friday or Saturday, Friday night probably, they all gathered at Maine Kelly's saloon, <laughs> and they'd close the doors at 12 or whatever they're supposed to, They'd all gang up around the piano, and they'd say, Jack, sing, sing, Jack, sing so-and-so. And he'd start off, and he'd sing. And he'd sing probably till, till whatever they closed. Yeah. And, uh, but I was always fascinated with that right. Mame Kelly's saloon. <laughs> yeah. did, he, uh, did he work going, through, going to school, too? or? Oh yes, yes he had to, he worked, uh, he didn't get paid for it, but he had to help the family in those days. And so he took care of the garden, and he picked cord, and uh, he worked for different farmers around town there in Sheffield, and uh, uh, I guess it really doesn't matter, it's all history. My grandfather at the time, Melvin Markley, Melville Markley, Sutton, was on the run. He was a bootlegger. Oh, <laughs> there are a lot of those around. And he would disappear. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, at that particular time, he was coming home from church, and in the buggy, and old Kate was in front, and Dad loved old Kate. I got a picture of him with his straw hat on and old Kate. But he thought old Kate was a pacer. And so they would have races. And so <clears throat> Jack, they, he would go and uh, uh, go to go into church. And they'd come back from church. And a bunch of the men came riding up and said, Sut. You better jump on because the sheriff's right behind me. <laughs> so my grandfather jumped on and he disappeared that way. My father, he was the oldest, so he took charge of He helped out and he went to school too. Yeah, probably yeah. And did he have any brothers and sisters? Yes, he had a brother. Uh, every other child died. But the ones that lived was, of course, my dad was the oldest, Jack. And then there was uh, uh, Marvin, then uh, Christine, Howard, and Roy. And th they all made it through, but every other one of the children died. What a terrible thing. Today, yeah. we would, it was unheard, it's unheard of. Yeah. But in those days, it, yeah. it happened. How far did he go in school? to uh, elementary school, eighth mm -hmm. grade. And um, he went into the Navy in 1919? 1919. 1919. How, how, how old was he when he went into the Navy? 
Well, he was uh, 92 years old. He was born, born in 99. And he said the, he was walking across the floor to have his physics physical for the Army for World War I. And he was, they were standing in line. And he came, guy came running in and says, the armistice is signed. We don't need nobody. So they said, forget it, you guys go on home. So he went home, and that's how close he came to being inducted into the Army. So he went home, and he decided, in those days, you see, people didn't have choice. You did what you had to do and take care of your family. And uh, Pappy, which was my grandpa, <laughs> justice of the peace, mm -hmm. Uh, he uh, was there, and, but he did it. He, he relied on my dad, and dad uh, joined the Navy in 1919, April, I think, 10th, 1919. Now, uh, and had he started corresponding with your mother by this time? No, he didn't okay. start corresponding with my mother until 1926, okay, well we'll when he was we'll, on the Yanks. Okay, we'll get to that then. Yeah. Okay, so he went in. Uh, do you know where he went for his training? And stuff? Yeah, Corpus Christi, Texas. Yep. And that's when he was wanting to go to a uh, uh, flying school? No. no. He, he, that was when he just went in the Navy. Just, just he was, he okay. just joined the Navy. Okay. And he went to Corpus Christi. And he, then after that, of course, he was assigned to the fleet. His first ship was the USS Texas. He that's went in the Black Gang. Battle, battleship, right? That was a battleship. He, w he was in the Black Gang, which was the coal heavers, because it was coal burning boilers. And I bought pictures of them, and they stand in there covered in coal dust. Do you remember when the Texas was built? No, I don't. No, no. She was old even, even then. then. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. She's down in the San Jacinto battleground right now. And you could go aboard her, but mm -hmm. uh, then uh, she was. Uh, He's, he spent a lot of time on the Texas. He rode, he was in the, what they call the race boat crew. And uh, those days, it wasn't such a thing as a skull to race with. You pulled a whale boat. Mm -hmm. And he was in that crew, and when he went back on leave after his first tour, Pappy says, Jack, you've got the best build I've ever seen in a man because of that rowing. There was no sliding seats. There was nothing. It was just plain, simple strength, and that's how he was. He was a strong man. And where, where was he? Uh, his first duty. Uh, where, where was that? That, that was uh, uh, oh, just, just. just uh, uh, where'd they go? Wherever. Uh, I believe it was the Pacific Fleet. Probably. He spent so much time in the Pacific. Uh, very little time. Until the war, he wasn't really in the Atlantic fleet. Right. Okay. So, um, and so when did he go to China? Was he? He was a site. He went. He first. He was on the USS California. There's a little story connected with that, which is very interesting. By this time, well, I'll, I really have to back up a little bit. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, he was on the uh, Black Hawk. The Black Hawk was the repair ship for the Yangtze people, patrol. And while he was on there, which was in the early, uh, real early 20s, uh, he was totally brown hair, chestnut hair. And uh, so they corresponded. But in the meantime, he's transferred to the USS California. So, uh, They said, uh, just before that, before he got transferred to California, the Admiral, of course, is a flagship. So the Admiral says, I want water. I am sick and tired of having to get water out of a bucket. I want water. And the California had what they call cold evaporators. The Texas, the old ships, they had what they called hot evaporators. And they only could produce a very small amount of water. So the, 
the captain of the Corps of the Admiral, they had, the California actually had to get water from either from shore or from the Texas or from somebody, somewhere. And, and the Admiral says, I'm sick and tired of this. I want to take a bath, I want to take a bath. Do something, you know, when the Admiral speaks, everybody jumps. So the captain of the California, because he's in San Diego, is it, uh, do you have anybody over there that can work on these cold evaporators? Because none of my people can. We can't find nobody, and the admiral's going to court marshal somebody. And uh, so my dad's chief engineer, don't know his name, he said, I'm going to send you back. And just any lady. So your dad, did he live uh, close to you guys when? He, he lived uh, at Concord. He retired yeah. when he retired from uh, the MEBA, Marine Engineer. Uh, he uh, lived in Concord and he did take uh, what they call night engineering jobs. And my husband and I lived in Alameda, naturally. Yeah. Uh, it's a strange thing about Alameda. Uh, I was always very sick. I had uh, strep throat, my ears burst, it had to be lanced. This, is, this went on from the time I was about three years old. Uh, there was four places that I never had trouble. I was able to go through a whole year without getting sick. One was Guantanamo Bay, San Diego, Florida, and Alameda, California. <laughs> when did your dad retire? 1940 died. Oh, okay. No, I, I know from the service, but I mean from the merchant. 15 years. It was 15 oh, years. Oh, so 15, uh, about 64 yeah, or something. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, what did he did ap do after he retired? Nothing. He, ha he had uh, uh, his pension. Was his health pretty good? Uh, it was very good. Uh, he was very still very strong. And um, they, like all Southern boys, for some reason or another, I, no one has ever been able to figure it out, but the South is in their blood. And he, my mother didn't want to go home, wanted him to go home. I mean, she didn't like it down there. And uh, he insisted. And so they went back to uh, Sheffield and Tuscumbia and Florence, and Florence is the big town and they bought a home back there. And they lived back in Florence, Alabama for a number of years. And about five years, I guess, or so. And uh, we'd drive back and see them. And I went back every year. My mother was bedfast by this time. She was an invalid. And I would go back myself. Dad would fly me back and I would stay a month and I would take care of her and him, and I would do all the cooking. And uh, of course he loved, he was like me. We would sit and talk, and he would talk. And uh, one time, he, while they were still in California here, uh, he bought a cabin up in Etowah Springs, which is up by Middletown. A beautiful little cabin, right on the creek. And the kids had just loved it big swimming pool and all. And I, of course, I listened to him and I said to myself, Dad's going to talk to me. And I made up my mind, I'm going to see how long I can, can stay awake. The children all came in, had their dinners, played, then they went to bed. And Dad and I sat down, he was drinking his coffee and he was sitting there. And, uh, the oldest girl of a family in the South is a sister. Sister. So sister, he says, sit down. I want to, we'll just have a little confab, you and me. I said, okay, and I thought, this is it. I'm going to, this is the test. The sun was coming up when I finally said, Dad, I got to lay down. <laughs> he said, all right, sister, you go, you go ahead, Let's get a little rest. That was all night. I meant to ask you, how did uh, your mother cope being a, a, a Navy wife and, and being away so much, him being away so much and stuff? 
of course it was a it was a real trial and uh, but she had gone to business college she was a very smart lady and of course with her upbringing and the way she felt she was a good woman there was no problem she was true and faithful did she work while no oh. she never worked she took care of the family uh, we travel. I've crisscrossed this country. I know 66 like the back of my hand. Uh, so I, we, we, whenever Dad would come in, wherever we were, he, we would go to where he was. And that's why I went to so many schools. And uh, uh, Now, was she Catholic also? No, nobody was Catholic. It was, I, we were all, he was a Presbyterian. Oh, but he went to a Catholic school. Oh, I thought, okay, I thought yeah, grew up uh, Catholic. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I see. I, I, I became a Anglican Catholic, and, uh, which is Episcopalian, right. and uh, uh, he's, his uh, motto is uh, Matthew 3.16, I believe. Know you first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you. And that was his motto. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's the way it goes. I'm not really sure, but it's there in the book. Sounds, the sounds about right. I and uh, uh, we traveled. Mother, we would. I, I considered myself very fortunate to finish nine months of school because by the time school was over, Mother packed the car. We always had a nice big car, and Mother packed the car literally, and. She packed so that my brother was very short, and he could have. A, she packed the foot so he had the foot rest, and he was on one side. And she always had her sewing machine with her, so she put the sewing machine in the middle and the back seat, and she packed everything around it. And I was on the other side, and I had my place, and Jimmy had his, and Mother drove, and we crisscrossed this country. Many times. And during your marriage, did you did you work any, or were you just I, raising I was, kids? I was. I mostly raised the children, yeah. uh, but I did uh, at times. I was a, a meat wrapper. I joined the oh, the meat yeah. cutters union in Oakland, and I became a meat wrapper. And uh, I worked when I needed to work, mm -hmm. and when I didn't need to work, I was staying at home. Um. And so, what do you, what do you do here in the desert? Or first of all, where do you live here in the desert? I live over in Palm Springs, mm -hmm. uh, having a nice apartment over there. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's on the ground floor, and uh, I don't have any stairs to climb. I began when I first came down here. I lived over at Date Palm Country Club, but uh, it's Indian land, and they made a mistake in the uh, closing when the people bought the. Date Palm, uh, they made a mistake in escrow, and there was thousands of dollars that had to be repaid to the Indians. Uh, it should have been done in escrow, but wasn't. So I had a home over there, and I I refused to pay three times the price for homeowners dues as I was paying for the trailer for the mobile. So I I moved to uh, Catalina Grove. And uh, I was over there till they sold it. And uh, then I'm, now I'm up Thornhill Drive, right off of Ramon in Palm Springs. And um, um, what do you do to occupy your time? Uh, well, I worked here at the museum for a, a wee bit of time. And uh, I really, it's about all I can do to take care of myself. Uh, I, my health has not been all that well. I've had, uh, uh, I suddenly developed heart trouble after my husband died, and uh, or before actually at 88, I had a triple bypass. We were still in Alameda, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had triple bypass. And then at 98, we lived in Modesto, had a beautiful home, and they had to, he died. My husband died. He was brain cancer and he died 30 days after he was diagnosed. Of course I knew that something was much wrong, but 
finally he was diagnosed and I kept him at home. I'm a very good nurse. And uh, so that uh, we had, I had to sell a place in Modesto because it was much too large for me to take care of money-wise. And so I sold it and I came down here and bought a mobile. And as the story goes, I wound up on Thornhill Road. <laughs> I think, uh, help describe again those uh, pins that you have on. I'm going to uh, do a little uh, close-up on them. Well, the red, the red pin uh -huh. is for my husband, a Marine, Marine yeah. Seago and Marine, and uh, I can't really, I can't well, read it. It no, says put, yeah. there, this is the commission officer's uh, insignia uh -huh. pin. It came off of my dad's uh, overseas ca hat that wow. they wear. He had the leaf on one side and this was on the other, yeah. and I took this one and I wear it in his honor. And uh, I have several of the Marine Corps pins right. that I bought while I was working yeah. here. It's very wonderful. To, yeah. And it reminds me, and I wear them and once, in, once in a while, I wear them. And uh, every time I do, uh, the waitresses and so forth, they always say, and how, how uh, they ask about them and say how wonderful it is yeah. to yes. have all those yeah have those memories. Absolutely, those mementos, yeah. Well, Jacqueline, uh, you have a wonderful family, and thank you for sharing with us. Anything you'd like to close with, dear? Well, I have a, I have a wonderful family, and uh, I have, uh, let's see, I have uh, a lot of grandchildren. I didn't ask you, how many grandchildren do you have, by the way? Uh, let's see, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten grandchildren, and three, four great grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> and uh, when I came down here, I did, of course, my heart went bad, and it did it acted up, and uh, the doctors decided I had AFib, arterial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, and uh, <laughs> so funny. The last time I it happened, I was walking in through the through the grounds at Catalina Grove. And I felt so weak I couldn't hardly make it. So I put the groceries, I had a little bag of groceries, I put it down the counter and got back in my car, who I call Precious. She's a 1930, uh, 1993 uh, Nissan Maxima, beautiful pearl color, has all the marks and deeps. And she's precious to me because she's paid off. And uh, I, went, I went back and I said, there's something radically wrong here. So I got back in my car, drove over to the immediate care, and they of course hooked me up to the all the stuff. And he took one look at the EKG and he started pulling his hair out. He says, "How did you get over here?" I said, "I drove." And he goes like this and pulls his hair up, and so he runs the phone and says, calls Kaiser. Then I had Kaiser Senior, and uh, Kaiser said transport. So that was the third time. Transport. So boop. So I go out the door, say call Indio, call my son, tell him where I'm going. So they turned me in at Red Desert Regional, and my cardiologist, Doctor Younger, Doctor, uh, they're all over there at uh, Rouse, Rouse office. And uh, he says, I'm sorry, Jacqueline, but this is the end. Uh, you will have to have a, trans uh, a pacemaker put in. You've, you've gone as long as you can. You've done a good job, but you can't go any further. So I had a pacemaker put in. So now I have a pacemaker. <laughs> and as long as that Energizer Bunny keeps hopping, Boy, I'm going to you're, be okay. You're good, good to go. Yeah. So, I'm doing just fine. Great. Okay. Well.
Well, Jackie, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing. I, I appreciate it very much. I'm very proud of my dad, and I'm very proud of my husband. Well, well, Both were, were outstanding men, and they deserve to be remembered. And uh, at the, when dad, when they took, they fleeted in those days when they fleeted the, took the uh, flight class out of the fleet, they had to take tests and that's what happened my dad. That's how my dad wound up in Pensacola oh, yeah, in the to, flight class. Yeah, you know, I, I meant to follow up on that. So what, what was the deal with that again now? Uh, well, in those days, the uh, early 20s, late, mid, mid-20s, uh, the, the Air Corps, of course, <laughs> Naval Air Corps, uh, they were fighting against it, of course, but they had they already, the Langley was all, right. they had already done that. And uh, so they had, uh, kicking and screaming, they decided they had to have air airmen. So they didn't have enough people. And so they, the smart ones, they gave them tests, and then they invited them, or transferred them back to the Pensacola to the flight class. And he was in the flight class, and he soloed in the ground planes. Mm -hmm. That was, he did that plane. And then, uh, the uh, air, the seaplane that he had, it was one of those old time planes where it has the big pontoon fuselage and the little pontoons under the wing. And evidently water had gotten into the big pontoon and as he came in to land on the water, the, the plane dipped a little bit to the side, rolled a little bit, and so he came down with that one wing. And the, the fellow standing on the beach, of course, watching everything. And uh, so he said, thumbs down. So dad was back to the fleet, and that's where he stayed. Well, probably just as well. Don't know what would have happened. Well, I asked my father with one of our famous monthly long confabs that I had, which I treasure. Uh, Dad, whatever happened to all those men that was in your flight class? Did you ever find out many of them? He says, no, sister, they're all dead. So he would have been gone, too. Instead of living to be 79 years old, he would have died a young man. But my mother wouldn't, she would not say no, you know. She, not, we were, I was just a baby, a little bitty baby. And he went back. And then five billets opened in the whole Pacific Fleet, no, I'll tell you about three. Three billets opened in the whole Pacific Fleet for Chief, uh, Chief uh, CPO, Chief Petty Officer. So Dad took the test, 100%. He put on the anchor, U.S. Ed. Three months later, five billets, Roosevelt, five billets opened up for warrant. But you had to take test. He took the test. He said to my mother, Maudie, now if I take if I take this test and I make warrant, I'm gonna to have to stay in for thirty years because there's no more to getting out on twenty. And so she said, Well, all right, whatever you want to do. He goes first. So he made war in 1935. So he's a Mustang. Then. So he's a Mustang. And he, uh, I have a picture of him. And uh, he was on the USS Brazos, which was a tanker. A little old ship, but it was a, uh, and uh, of course by now he's eligible to go in the wardroom and eat, see. Of course, the uh, head of the table is the exec and so forth and so on. So the exec says, Jack, uh, why don't you have your family come aboard and have dinner with us? Now, you have to remember that my brother and I were very small. He was only five. I was barely five and he was four, somewhere along there. And uh, so my mother drilled us on how to conduct ourselves. 
in the wardroom because we were served, as you well know, doctor, of the, the mess boys came around and they helped, you had to serve yourself and they serve from the left and pick up from the right and all that good stuff. And there's all this silver, you know. And so she says, now, this is what you're going to have to do and this is the way you will behave. And you will make your father proud. So we went to dinner on the brazos in the wardroom with their napkins and the silver and the mess boys serving us off of those silver trays. And after it was all over, the exec says, anytime your family or you want to have your family come aboard, we would be overjoyed to have them. We enjoyed your children so much. Well, I think that's a good testament to your family and a good time to wrap it up. Thank you very much for all that you've done. I thank you again. Thank you, Jay.